Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer because I know that I need prayer. I know you need prayer. But listen, before we do, remember, you didn't come to church to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. You didn't come to hear from an old man or a young man or a white man, a brown man, a dark man. Whatever it is, you came to hear from God. Don't ever come to church to hear from a man. Why? Because man has nothing to say. So I'm going to get down on my knees, and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer, and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit speak to us today. So if you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? And let's stand together in reverence and in honor. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here in the church. Lord, we thank you that your word says that I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why? Because that's where your presence is. Lord, your word says that when two or more are gathered together, there you are in the midst of them. So Father, we thank you that you are here today. We don't come into this place for tradition. We don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. But Lord, we do come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So God, it's in the name of Jesus we ask your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to minister to us, to show us things in the Word of God today and in our lives that we would leave this place equipped, fulfilled, ready to go out and to be representatives of Jesus Christ and the gospel of, of, of Jesus to the world and to those who are around us. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. Lord, these blessings that we ask upon ourselves, we don't ask just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the world and around the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but Lord, we do acknowledge that we are many members of one body, that is the body of Christ, working together, serving together to build the kingdom for your glory. So Lord, we ask that you would bless our Baptist brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, our Methodist and Episcopalian and Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our charismatic and Pentecostal brothers and sisters and our Foursquare denominational brothers and sisters. God, we ask for the churches all around the Inland Empire, for Harvest, the Grove, Lord, for Sandals, the Well, the Way World Outreach Center. Lord, we thank you for Ecclesia, for Emmanuel Baptist, for Trinity, for Crossroads, for Abundant Living Oak Valley, all the churches all across the Inland Empire. Really, truly, too many to name. God, we are all many members of your family, Lord, of your body, working together to build the kingdom for your glory. So, Lord, to you be the praise. Lord, to you be the glory and honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're being seated, I'll give you this, my love. Here, I'll toss it at you. Well, that's my beautiful wife. Hey, girl, what's up? She never gets up. So, listen, if you got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Hebrews. As we continue our study in the book of Hebrews, line upon line, precept upon precept. If you're just joining us, we've been in Hebrews for quite some time. We find ourselves now in Hebrews in the sixth chapter. An exciting section of verses, and I'm excited for what God's got in store. I know that you're going to leave this place encouraged. So many people already have told me, Pastor Luke, this message was for me today. But let me just tell you, before you tell that to me at the end of the service, that this message was for me today. But praise God, I'm glad that we all got something out of this because we're all going through some things in our life. But today, the, the, the title of this morning's message is this, A Formula for Success. Now, I can't speak to you. I can only speak to myself. But I know that in everything that I do, in every endeavor in my own life, I want to be successful. Whether that be as a husband, I want to be a successful husband. Whether that be as a father to my kids, I want to be a successful father. As a pastor or a minister, you know, I want to be successful in what I do. In business efforts, anything I put my hand to, I want to be successful. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons that we pray here at the church on the end of the, of the service that everything we put our hands to, you can say it with me, they shall prosper because we believe that we want to be successful. Now again, I say I can't speak to you. Maybe you don't want to be successful, but I have the inkling that you want to be successful in your life as well. So the title of today's message is A Formula for Success. And we're going to read out of Hebrews in the 6th chapter, looking at verse number 12 today, the formula for success. But before we get into that, and we're going to tie it all together uh, throughout the course of this message, I want to read you a little comic strip story that I saw that I thought really set up the message for today. So let me read this to you. A little boy looked up to the sky and he asked God, God, what does a billion years mean to you? The voice from the heavens came back saying, just one second. The boy asked again, wow, God, what does a billion dollars mean to you? Again, the voice from heaven replied, it's just a penny. Whoa, the boy said as he replied back, God, in that case, can I have a penny? <laughs> and the voice from heaven replied back to him, yes, wait just one second. 
For those of you that it's kind of settling in, remember a second was a billion years to God, you know, kind of, all right. The formula for success that we're going to look at out of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, in the verse, in the twelfth verse, let's just go ahead and put it up on the overhead. As we kind of resume in the middle of this thought, Hebrews in the sixth chapter, the twelfth verse, says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Today we're going to look at these two subjects, faith and patience. These are two subjects that in our own walks as Christian, in our own lives as Christian, are essential. Not just recommended, not just something that you and I should do or should live or should operate in, but rather we'll see today out of the Word of God that you and I must, are required to live in. Now I know that these are two subjects for you and I that are exciting. I don't know, there's, there's nothing better about faith, uh, about the Word of God than talking and preaching about faith. And I know, oh church, do I know that you and I love the subject of patience because we as Southern Californians, when we go to those Southern California amusement parks, we are excited when we get there and we see the three hour line for the 30 second ride. We are excited when we get on the freeways and we see the red tail lights. We are just ecstatic about waiting on the phone for customer service to answer the phone, right? We love patience. Well, okay, maybe not quite so much, but today I, I promise by the end of this message, you'll be encouraged, you'll be strengthened, you'll be fulfilled in what God has for you and ready to get out there and do because this is the formula that God lays for us in our lives to be successful. Now in Hebrews in the 6th chapter and the 12th verse, they talk about the subject of inheriting the promise. Now I'm sure that we'll get to that as we discuss Hebrews the 6th chapter and, and, and further on and looking forward in more detail. But off, off, oftentimes when we think about this promise or this inheritance and we look towards the great and the grand goal of that inheritance, and that obviously is our eternal life with Christ, with God, in heaven for eternity. That is our inheritance. We can't wait for that glorious day whenever it might come, whether it be when the Lord takes us or when Jesus, if he tarries or if he, if he comes back and returns and we go to heaven with him. That is great. That is wonderful. Our inheritance awaits us. But let me tell you something, the subject of faith and patience and the subject of inheriting promises doesn't stop solely upon heaven and waiting for that moment, but rather it trickles down from that pinnacle or that promise of our promises all the way down to everything that we do in our life, in every season, in every area that we work and that we live in in our life, to the grandest things of life, to the smallest, most insignificant things, we have got to apply these two subjects or these two words to our life, that is faith and patience. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at, the, look at these two words. Now obviously we don't have time to really grab a hold of and go super in-depth, but I'm encouraged that throughout the study of Hebrews we're going to really take some in-depth look at, the, at these two words. But today I'm encouraging you to grab a hold of what God has for you as we look for the formula and look at the formula for success. Before we get into that formula, let's talk about these two words, faith and patience. For the first part out of Hebrews, the sixth chapter, faith, let me say it like this. Faith. It's what gets us going. Faith, it's what gets us going. It's the motivation in life. It's the, 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 the factor, the ambition in life, if you, if you want to say it like that. Faith is mandated for us. It's not an option. It's not something that you and I should do, but rather you and I are required to do. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that through the grace of God, by the grace of God, through the means of faith, we are saved. When we obtain salvation through faith, that brings us into a path of inheritance and promises of God. So in order for us to receive the, uh, the inheritance and the promises of God, we have got to operate in faith, not just that we should be in faith. It's mandated. Before we go any further, you've got to understand we have to live in faith. You can't have your salvation without it. You got me today? Are we here? Right. Good. We have to exercise our faith in order to receive the promises of God. If you've got your Bibles, we're in Hebrews, the 6th chapter. Just turn with me a couple pages over to Hebrews in the 11th chapter. We call this the Hall of Faith. Now, I'm sure that it will be some time before we get there. By the time we get to Hebrews in the 11th chapter, I'm, I'm well certain that you will have forgotten this message at some point in time. And this will be all new news to you again, which is good. But here in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, we're talking about the subject of faith. And in verse number 6... Looking at faith, it says in Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number 6, that but without faith it is impossible. Listen, impossible. Not improbable, impossible. It is impossible to please Him, God. 
For two reasons. Why is it? Number one, that he who comes to God must believe that God is. You've got to believe that God is God. Secondly, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith, we see, according to the word of God, that it is impossible to please God. Now, if you're a parent or if you've ever had children, you know that you're not going to bless your children when they're in a state of disobedience. Why? Because that would encourage them to remain in that state. So if you and I want to be blessed and by way of blessings, inheriting the promises of God and being successful in our lives, we have got to live a life that is pleasing to God. And in doing so, we operate in faith. It is required for us to be pleasing to God and in by, by way of being pleasing to God, inheriting the promises and accepting and getting those things that God has promised to us in our lives. Now, I love the, the, a few verses down. The Bible tells us about the patriarch of faith, Abraham, the father of faith. Now, in Genesis, God talks to Abraham, and he calls Abraham out of the land where Abraham is, and he says to Abraham, leave the place in which your father, of your father's land to a place I will show you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. In you, all the people of the earth shall be blessed. And God lays out this inheritance and this promise to Abraham. And look what it says in Hebrews 11, chapter, just a few verses down in verse number 8 about Abraham. By what faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You see, when Abraham left the place that God had called him to go, God said, I'm going to take you somewhere that you don't know. I'm not going to show you how we get there, but I'm going to lead you in the process of getting there. And when Abraham got there, it wasn't as though he arrived and there was the, the real estate sign with the sold sign on the top of it saying, here it is. Abraham had to, had to achieve that, or had to work for it, had to, had to operate in faith. And it wasn't for four generations that Abraham's great-grandchildren became the nation of Israel, his grandson being named Israel. And so it was a period of process. But you know, the interesting thing about Abraham, the interesting thing about Abraham operating in faith is what God said to Abraham is in essence exactly what God says to each and every one of us in this walk that we live and in this life that we live. Tell me if this doesn't sound like salvation to you and I. When God says to us, hey, come follow me, come follow my son, and I will take you from who you once were the place of your comfort zone, the identity that you once had, and I will bring you into a new place. I will give you a new identity. I will bless you in doing so, but I'm not going to tell you what it's going to be like on the way. I'm not going to tell you where you're going to go along the way, but if you trust me, you will be blessed. You see, faith is in essence the, the, the necessity for us to, to follow God, like Abraham, to step out of who we once were so that we can be who God has called us to be. Because you and I both know that it is God's will that we don't remain the same, but rather we become imitators of Christ or that we become people who follow and represent and shine the glory of God in whatever area of our life. So faith is what gets us going. It's the motivating factor. By faith we obtain the promises of God. Faith is our motivation. It's the ambition. But you know, ambition will only take you so far. In our own lives, ambition will only go as far as our ability to carry out that ambition. I think of it like this. One of the things that I enjoy doing is, is hiking and specifically climbing or, or, or summiting on top of mountains. Now, everybody always asks me, Pastor, look, are you going to do Mount Everest? Well, that's not really the kind of thing I like to do. Typically, the thing I like to do is involves feet walking and not hands climbing. But I enjoy looking at that. And faith, the motivation is when I look to a distant mountain and I can see the summit of that mountain in the distance and I say, I want to stand on the top of that mountain. The motivation is there. The ambition is set inside of me, and I begin to study the maps. I begin to plan a course. I begin to go and do the things that I want to do in order for me to achieve the goal and the motivation for me to do that which I want to do. But then what happens is, is once you get into that area, have you ever heard the story? You can't see the forest through the trees. Once you get close to the mountain, all of a sudden the summit disappears because now you're in the mountain. Now you're in the forest. Now all of a sudden that ambition, that motivation is, is, is dwindling and pressures of life come. It becomes hard in the journey. There are, there are things that come against us in life, in our own walk, and all of a sudden we have to have something that carries us through the ambition to the point that we can get to the end goal of where we want to be. Life has a way of bringing challenges our way. 
There has, uh, life has a way of, of bringing hardships, of pressure, uh, of things that come against us our way. And faith is what gets us going. But the second part of what we're talking about today is patience. And patience is what keeps us going. Faith is what gets us going. It's the motivation. It's the power behind getting out and doing something. It's the action in which we do. But now patience is what keeps us going. And much like faith, it is mandated for you and I as Christians to live a life of patience. You see, Hebrews in the, in the, 11th, or I'm sorry, in the 6th chapter doesn't tell us that by faith they obtained the promises and inheritance, but rather by faith and patience. So you see, faith and patience go hand in hand. They work together. It is necessity. It is a necessity for you and I to operate in patience. Hallelujah. If that doesn't just make you want to jump out of your chair and scream, maybe not in a positive way, we have got to live a life of patience. The Bible tells us in James, the first chapter, that our faith will be tested. But in the testing of our faith produces patience. Patience brings us to a state of, of perfection or of maturity. In the testing of our faith or of our belief, now our patience is put on trial. And in learning patience, in operating in that, we become mature in understanding the things of God. In Romans, the fifth chapter, the Bible tells us that patience brings on character. And character brings us to hope. Now, the interesting thing about hope is, as defined in the Word of God, hope is basically a confident expectation. You see, you can't have faith unless you have hope. Why? Because if you don't have a confident expectation of something, what gives you the right or the ability to believe it? Let me boil it down to you like this. If you didn't have a hope of Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior, where would your faith be based on of following Jesus? But rather, the Bible tells us that Jesus came and died for our sins, that we could follow Him and, and, and live eternal life with God in heaven. That is our confident expectation, and now our faith follows through, built on the foundations of our hope. And the Bible tells us in Romans that our, our perseverance, our patience, produces character, which brings on hope. You see, so hope is the foundation of faith, and faith brings on perseverance or patience, which brings on hope. And so you see, it's this cycle. It's this circle of, 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 of operating in our lives. And so we have got to live a life of patience that's required of you and I as Christians to live in patience. Praise God. If you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke. Let's go to the book of Luke in the 21st chapter. Luke 21. Here Jesus is, is laying out for his disciples, his followers, a, a picture of what things to come will look like. Really starting in verse number 10, but I'm going to pick up in verse number 16 of the 21st chapter. Jesus is painting this picture, and, he, and I believe in verse number 16 it really paints the picture. It really gives us, gives us the idea of where he's going with this. In verse number 16 of Luke in the 21st chapter, Jesus says to his disciples, You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But verse number 18 comes along and says, But not a hair of your head shall be lost. Now, interesting that Jesus says some of us, some of them would be put to death. But then he goes on to say, Not a hair on your head would be lost. How is that? Because Jesus is speaking to the internal inheritance that we have. You see, the Bible tells us that God knows every hair that is on our head. Praise God for some of us. It's more than others. This morning may have been less than yesterday, but God knows every one of them. And Jesus says that you will not lose a hair on your head. Why? Because in eternity, inheriting the promises of God, you get it all back. He says, you know, some of you might be put to death by those who would love you. You know what? The hair that you have, it's going to fall out anyways. The skin that you and I live in, as we get older, gravity's going to take its place, and it's going to droop and sag anyways. But here in eternal inheritance, in the kingdom of God, we will have a place that moth does not destroy, but rather a new and redeemed body, where some of us who have less than others will look like Samson in heaven, because all of those hairs that we once had, God says, you won't lose a single one of them. So Fred, there's hope for you today. But he goes on to say, here it is, verse number 19. By your patience, possess your souls. By your patience, possess your souls. 
Jesus says, the people closest to you might turn on you. But by your patience, possess your souls. The New Living Translation says, by standing firm, you will win your souls. You see, in life, there are going to be times. You might be in one of those times right now. But there will be times for each and every one of us when all signs point to giving up. When your family's going to tell you you're crazy. When everything around you says that faith isn't working, that your belief isn't working, that what you're going through right now, is a, there's a reason for it, and you need to stop what you're doing and evaluate your life. But you see, patience is what keeps us going because we know that God is on the other side. And though we might be facing mountains in our life, the Bible says that if we have faith of a mustard seed, we can say to that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. So you see, patience is what keeps us going. Jesus, as he recounts the same, or Matthew, as he recounts the same statement that Jesus makes, and Matthew, I'll just put it up, it says, Jesus says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. You've heard this before, if you've ever been in church for any amount of time, that we're not walking, or we're not running a sprint, but this is a marathon in which we live. Paul the Apostle said that I have fought the fight, I have finished the race. We keep our eyes focused on God, and it is our patience our long-suffering, our fortitude in God that keeps us moving forward and in a forward direction. Pastor Jim a few weeks ago said that patience is the antidote to the pressures of life. That patience is the antidote to the pressures of life. You see, this life that we live is a pressure cooker. The more we add to this life, the more money we add in our jobs, the more responsibility we add in our work, the more kids we add to our homes, the more rooms we add to our homes, the more cars we add to our garage, the more tires we add to our cars, whatever it might be, the pressure builds on our lives. And if we have nothing to relieve that pressure, there will be a time in our lives where we break or we pop. But patience is the antidote to the pressures of life because we know that God is on our side. And though it might be an uphill battle right now, though it might be a long and a hard journey in which we're going through, we know that on the other side is God and our inheritance and our promises. And we can endure. There was a man in history by the name of William Carey. William Carey became a shoe cobbler. A shoe cobbler is basically a shoemaker or somebody that came and repaired shoes in the olden days. William Carey lived in England, and now in this time, God had set something upon his heart to go and minister to the people of India. And so William Carey ventured on his journey to India, and in this process, he was faced with delay after delay after delay. Now, see, you and I get frustrated when we get on the freeway and we see traffic. Now, imagine trying to get to your destination and being delayed for years on the 10 freeway. Praise God we don't. So William Carey was a man who faced delay after delay after delay. And when he got to India, he faced hardship after hardship after hardship after hardship. And it was on his heart, God had impressed upon him to translate the gospel of Jesus Christ into the modern dialect or to the, 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 the geographical dialect. And there William Carey fought a fight. There he lost his two-year-old son. There his wife died. There all of his life's work towards the end of his life, all of the translations, all of the teachings, all of the things that he had done to, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to these people was lost in a fire and everything was destroyed. William Carey said that the road traveled the second time is easier than the first. One of the things that he said towards the end of his life was this statement, I can plod, I can persevere in any definite endeavor. To this, I owe everything. Now, when I said that statement to my wife, I had this power and, and, and zeal behind it, and I thought, man, that's such an amazing statement. And she looked back at me like many of you are looking at me right now, and she said, what does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. To plod means to walk doggedly and heavily. To plod means to walk doggedly and heavily. heavily. You know, I think back to the illustration of, of, of climbing or hiking to the top of a mountain. When you start off, it's early in the morning, you've got a, a breakfast in you, and you've got all this energy and motivation, and your steps are fast, and your pace is good, and you're making good timing. But as you progress, your body begins to fatigue, you become hungry. As you increase in elevation, the air decreases, or the oxygen decreases, and it becomes harder and harder to do things, and your pace begins to slow. And I remember there was one mountain that I was on, and we were above the tree line, and we had to take 20 steps and take a break. It was so tiring for us. And to plod simply means to put your head down, 
down and to put one foot in front of the other. You might say, you know what? I'm not going fast. I'm not running like when I started this race, but praise God, by the power of God and by the patience of God, I'm still putting one foot in front of the other and I'm not stopping. I'm not backing down. Hey, it may, I may not get there when I thought I was going to get there, but praise God, I am going to get there. And William Carey said it's the ability to put one foot in front of the other that he can persevere any definite endeavor, meaning anything you put your mind to, anything that God has set upon your heart, when you put your nose to the grindstone and you realize that through perseverance, through patience, that's the patience that God has given you, that you will reach the summit. Listen, there's mountains that you and I face each and every day that are on top of us, but let me tell you something, through the pers perseverance and patience of God and through faith and motivation, we will one day stand on the summit of the mountains that we face and that which was behind us, the journey that is heavy, the pain and the suffering that came alongside of that journey will no longer be applicable. Why? Because we will stand in victory knowing that our patience brought us to the place that God had for us. And this man, William Carey, who lived a life of hardship, who faced delay after delay, became known to a modern church as the father of modern missions. The model in which we send missionaries out today was based off of this man who learned how to plod and persevere. Because perseverance, because patience is essential to you and I. So how do we put this all together? How do we apply this to the formula for our success? Well, let's talk about this. Faith can only go so far without patience. Much like ambition can only go so far without ability. Patience can only last so long without hope. And hope is the foundation of our faith. So in other words, let me use this word. Faith and patience are synergetic. What does that mean? Some, a lot of people always ask, Pastor Luke, what does that mean? I hear businesses talking about synergy all the time. Synergetic simply, simply means this, that there are two substances, and both of them are good on their own, but when they come together and they work together, they are stronger, more beneficial, more powerful together than when they were when they were separate. And you see, you can go through life and say, wow, I've got faith, and you can go through life and say, wow, I will survive. But whatever you do, when you put the two together, now all of a sudden, your life becomes synergetic. Why? Because faith produces patience. The testing of our faith produces patience. Patience produces character. Character brings hope. Hope is the foundation for faith. You know what that means? That means upon hope, you build faith. Upon faith, you use patience. On patience, you get hope. On hope, you get faith. On faith, you get patience. On patience, you get hope. On hope, you get faith. On faith, and you see it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm sure there are many of us in this place today that as we live our lives, we look back at the things that we once believed for, we can scoff or we can laugh at them and say, wow, I can't believe that I had a hard time believing that God would come through on this because now the things that we face in our life are much greater. And you see, that is exactly it. When you apply faith and patience together and they work together, they are more powerful together than they are apart. And that is why they are mandatory for you and I. So the question begs then, how do we operate in faith how do we operate in patience? Well, let's start with faith. How do I operate in faith? The Bible simply tells us in Romans, the 10th chapter. Romans in the 10th chapter, verse number 17, very familiar verse for many of us. It says that faith comes by how? Hearing. And hearing comes by what? No, well, let's try that again. Half of you were here. Faith comes how? Hearing, hearing comes how? Hearing. All right, see, so now half of you aren't hearing. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing comes by what? Now, you see, you can just hear, but you can't just hear because, you know, I've got two kids at home. They scream all day long. I hear them, but do I listen? <laughs> so you and I have got to set time aside to sit under the Word of God, to allow the Word of God to influence our lives, to affect us, to become ingrained inside of us, to listen to the Word of God so that when we listen to it, we can apply it, and when we apply it, we live it. You see, there was a man by the name of John Wesley, John Wesley is the, uh, is the, is the uh, founder of the Methodist denomination in England. He is the father of the evangelical awakening in England. John Wesley uh, went to his mentor and his friend one day, a man by the name of Peter Bowler. And Peter, he said, to his, he said to his mentor and his friend, I have no faith. I think it's time for me to resign or step back from the ministry. And his friend in all of his wisdom replied to him simply this, John, preach faith until you have it. And when you have it, preach it. 
Preach faith until you have it, and when you have it, preach it. You see, that is common sense. Why? Because you have got to exercise faith to get it, and when you get it, you will exercise it. My friend, Lionel, stand up for me, my man. You don't look like that, a wall of a man, overnight. You have got to exercise your muscles to build them. And then when you build, sit down, man. This is my message instead of yours. And when you exercise your muscles, you will build them. And when you build them, you will exercise them. For the guys in the house, I know that you have stood in front of the mirror after doing some push-ups or some sit-ups and said, oh, wow, I see something that wasn't there before. And it's motivation to continue on. You see, it's the same in faith. You have got to apply faith or live it, exercise it, even though you may not feel it. And when you get it, you will exercise it. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. How do we then operate in patience? Oh, the blessed subject of patience. How do we live in patience? Well, a few ways that we live in patience. First, patience is the hope of the hope. We, patience comes by hope, the foundation of our faith. In 1 Thessalonians, I'll put it up, Paul, as he is exhorting the church, says, I have not ceased to remember your work of faith, your labor of love, and the patience of hope. Remember that foundation of faith, that confident expectation that we have. So patience comes from hope. Because there's a hope, because we have a reason to believe, we put our head down and one foot in front of the other. You see, if you lose hope, what point is there in continuing? So patience comes through hope. We have a hope. How else does patience come? Well, the Bible tells us in Galatians that patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Meaning that when we live, when we operate, when we live according to the ways of God, the Bible says that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That, lo that word is patience, fortitude, longevity. That is a fruit of living in the things of God. The Bible tells us that the patience is a sign or evidence of love. So when we operate in the love that God has for us and that God has asked us to live for others, that patience is a sign or a fruit of that. How else does patience come? Well, patience comes from God. I hear oftentimes people saying, Luke, Pastor Luke, somebody once told me, never pray for patience. Now, I, I, see the, I see the merit in this subject because, you know, we've heard the statement before, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Now, if you were to go to God, oftentimes the, the, the thought is, Lord, I need patience. Oftentimes, or more often than not, rather than showering you with an abundance of patience, He will shower you with an abundance of opportunity. So we, so oftentimes as Christians, become afraid to ask God for patience. But can I tell you something? Can I share with you something? Regardless of what you ask or you don't, or you, whether you're afraid or you're not, you're not going to avoid difficult people. Amen. You're not going to avoid obstacles or opportunities to exist in patience. You're not going to avoid hard times in life. Regardless if you ask God or not, they're going to come. So you know what I say? It's better to ask God for something that I need than be afraid to because of what's coming my way. Because it's going to come no matter what. And the Bible tells, Paul exhorts the church again as he, as he exhorts them and he believes for them in prayer. And in 2 Thessalonians, he says, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So Paul says, May the Lord direct our hearts into the patience of Christ. The patience comes from God. It's our faith that provides our motivation. Our patience provides our forward movement. So here it is. Let's put this together. The formula for success. Hebrews in the sixth chapter, verse number 12. Four things out of this verse. The formula for success. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Here it is, the formula for success. Number one, it's going to take work. Now, the Bible clearly tells us that we don't work for our salvation. But because of our salvation, we are put to work by God. It's going to take work, not sluggish life or laziness. Secondly, the formula for success is that God hasn't directed us in a life without giving us examples to follow or a roadmap of, by way of giving us people. So we have got to follow after the examples that were set before us. The formula for success, the third element to that formula, is that we have got to operate in patience, or I'm sorry, excuse me, 
faith, that is, that's what keeps us or gets us going, the motivation to get up and do something. And the last formula for the success today is that we have got to operate in patience. That is what keeps us going. To keep putting one foot in front of the other. One in front of the other. Whether it be fast-paced or slow-paced. Whether we have to stop and take a break for a minute, but to not give up, to not quit, to not relent, but to continue to push forward. Like Paul the Apostle said, I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. And let me say this by way of, of encouragement. One of the verses that I love to say all the time is Galatians in the 6th chapter, the ninth verse. It says, let us not grow weary while doing good. Why? For in due season we shall reap. How? If we do not lose heart. Which means, church, there may be a mountain in your way. And you may be on your way up that mountain. And it may be a long and a terrible journey. It might take everything that you have in life to get up there. But the Bible says, don't grow weary while doing good. Why? For in due season, you may get to the top of a hill and think that you're at the top only to see miles ahead still to go. But you will look at the top and there is hope that one day, one day in due season, you will stand on the summit of the mountain that once stood on top of you. And you will say, no longer is this mountain on top of me, but now it is under my and I will reap if I don't lose heart. Yesterday, a lady said to me, Pastor Luke, this message was for me. I feel like I'm in a little boat in the middle of the ocean in a great big storm. And I said to her, listen, faith and patience. One thing that you and I have got to remember is we may feel like we're in a boat in the middle of the ocean in a great big storm. But one thing that you and I know, the hope that we have that builds our patience, is that we have Jesus Christ in that boat with us. And if you ever read any account in the New Testament when Jesus was in a boat during a storm, things worked out okay. In due season, you will reap if you don't lose heart. Faith and patience. The formula for success. Faith and patience. You can do it. All you got to say is, I can do it. I can do it. Why? Because the Bible says that what? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Praise God. God is good. Amen? Hey, listen, let me do one more thing. Give me a moment more of your attention. Thank you for remaining seated. Thank you for staying. I want to just ask you a question. You see, the Bible tells us that we ought to examine ourselves from time to time. So let me ask you a question that you can examine your heart. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question. Why don't you answer that in your heart? Do you know that nowhere will you find that you can get to heaven because you want to, because you think so, or because you hope so. As a matter of fact, if you say, well, I think I'm going to get to heaven, I hope I'm going to get to heaven, or I want to get to heaven, just by the very fact that you say that, you're likely not on your way. Why? Because if you knew it, you would go. If you, if you were on your way, you would know. See, you can't get to heaven because you want to. Like, I think I can, I think I can. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, because you do good deeds, because you give to charitable organizations, or you don't rob the 7-Eleven. Nowhere will you find that in the Word of God, that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven. Yet so often in America, we believe that all we have to do is live good lives to get ourselves into heaven. But the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough. We can't work our salvation or work our way into salvation. It's more than that. You know, sometimes we believe, oh, well, I was brought up in church. My parents took me to church as a child. I was baptized or christened or attended seven Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. All my life, my parents told me I was a Christian. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attended church as a child, because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school classes or something like that, that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does, you, does it say that. You won't find that in the Word of God. Oftentimes we think, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I, I've called myself a Christian all my life. Pastor Luke, I've got a cross or St. Christopher around my neck. I've got a tattoo on my back or on my wrist or on my foot that has a scripture reference. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Listen, just because you've given yourself the title of Christian doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. You see, what we do in our day and age is we say, I'm a Christian, but, and then add the vice behind. You see, God's not after a title. God's not after the outward expression. God's not after the outward look. There's something more to it than that. Jesus, as he was speaking to a religious leader of his day, a man by the name of Nicodemus, you can find it in John, the third chapter, as they were conversing about the subject of eternal life, Jesus gave Nicodemus the pathway, the way to get there. And that is, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, 
You've heard of born again. You've heard that term, Hollywood popular, culture, society. They make you think of crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Here it is. You ready? That you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. God's not after the fact that you can memorize John 3, 16 and a few other verses. Why? Because the Bible tells us that the devil in hell knows some of the scriptures of the Bible. The Bible tells us that the demons know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because God is after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church. People like you and I, hearing the word of God, doing good things, sitting and congregating and, and, and in the name of, of God. And he says to the church, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, he says, because if I find you lukewarm, Jesus says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. Rude, crude, shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. You say, well, Pastor Luke, what does lukewarm mean? You think of it on a day like today, a hot day. Lukewarm is like a warm soda on a hot day. It just doesn't do the job. In terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's a little bit in and a little bit out, a little bit up and a little bit down. You're kind of bouncing around a little bit of, it, a little bit of church, a little bit of, of, of the things of, of the world, of your own life. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus says, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. Let me love you enough. Let me respect you enough. Let me honor you enough to tell you the truth today. You can't get to heaven on your own devices. You can't get to heaven based on your own thoughts. The only way we can get there is God's way. You see, it's God's heaven. It's God's way. The only way we can get there is God's way. Oftentimes people say, oh, well, I appreciate that. You get to heaven your way. I'll get to heaven my way. We'll all get there the same. Listen, that's like saying all roads lead to the moon. I'm sorry, no matter which way you drive, no matter which direction you travel in, you'll never drive to the moon. Why? Because it doesn't work that way. The only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way. And Jesus says this about himself, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. We can't do it any other way but God's way. So today, let's not do it any other way but God's way. Jesus Christ also said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his Father. So today, I want to give you the opportunity today to ensure your place in heaven, to leaving hell behind. You know, you might even say, Pastor Luke, I don't believe in heaven. I'm not sure of the existence of hell. Listen, let me tell you something. Just because you don't think it's real doesn't mean it's not. It's real enough for God to speak about it. It's real enough to Jesus to teach about it. It's real enough for the Bible and the New Testament to tell us about it. It's real enough and serious enough for you and I to stop playing games and take it for real. So today I want to give you that opportunity. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So what are we going to do? In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible, just like that. And on the count of three, if that's you in this place, I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place in heaven for eternity, leaving hell behind. And what I want to ask you to do is to raise your hand. We'll do it all at the same time in just a moment. And what you're doing by the raising of your hands, you're saying, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give God all my heart. I want to give him all of my life. I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I don't think I can do that. I'll be embarrassed. People I came with are going to see me. They're going to know. Listen, let me tell you something. Wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God? The decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And you see, God has done everything he could by giving for you and I, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. The decision is ours. So who should raise their hand today? If that's you in just a moment, if you've never given him all your heart, you've never given God all your life today, if that's you in just a moment, when I count to three, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you're not sure. Listen, don't leave today without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. You don't know what tomorrow holds. So don't leave today without making sure. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you did this at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusader as a child, but you never really followed through with it, never really got into it. Listen, today, if that's you, in just a moment, pop your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. We'll go forward from there in our relationship with God. And finally, who should raise their hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, if that's you today, let's make the day of your salvation. You're leaving hell behind, going forward in your relationship, ensuring for this day forward, for all of eternity, that you're going to spend the rest of your life 
with God in heaven, leaving hell behind and the life that you once lived behind. The decision's yours. All across this auditorium, whether you're in the front or the back, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you hear the sound of my voice around campus, wherever you're at, in the Love Rock Cafe, online, or in the foyer, wherever you're at, stop what you're doing and raise your hand so somebody can see and we'll go forward in our relationships with God today. Here we go. I'm going to count. Get ready. This is the moment of your salvation. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. Where are you at? Let me see your hands today. I see you. One, two. I see you. Where's your hands at? Let me see your hands. Three. I see you right there. Where are you guys at today? I see uh, Usher. Four. I see you back there. If you're raising your hand, let me see it. Five. I got you right over here. Where are you at? Anybody else on this side over here? Five wise people. I got him. I got you right there, my friend. Six. I see you right there. Over on this side, if you got your hand up, let me see. Uh, give me a little wave. I got you right there. Seven. Where are you at? All right. Anybody else over here today? Say, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. I see ushers pointing. I see you in the family room. Eight. Where are you at today? Anybody else in this place? How many in the family room? One, two, nine. All right. Hey, listen, where are you at? Number 10, you say, man, I wonder if I should listen. It's not about me. It's not about man. You say, man, I feel like this guy's pushing me. I feel like this guy's driving me. You know what? I'm trying to drive you into heaven. But let me tell you this. It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Where are you at? Let me see your hand. I see Usher waving. He's in the foyer? All right, that's number 10. Where are you at, number 11? Come on. God's speaking to you. It's the goodness of God on your heart. Two in the foyer. I got you. Number 11. Number 12, come on, where are you guys at? I'm not selling knives at the county fair. Where are you at? You want to give them all your heart? You want to give them all your life? Come on, 13, I see you. 13 wise people. The Spirit of God's on you. You saying, I know I should. I wonder if I should. Come on, let's go forward in your life today. It's worth it. It's worth it today. Anybody else? 13 wise people. Didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? 13 wise people. 14, I got you. Praise God. Where are you at? Number 15, saying, I wonder if I should. 15, I got you. Oh, come on, where are you at, number 16? Oh, I feel you in this place. I got her already, I got her already. Where are you at, number 16? I got you, you can put your hand down, my man, my friend. 16 wise people, anybody else? Anybody else? Well, hey, praise God for 15 wise people, anybody? <laughs> praise God. Hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. In a moment, everybody's going to stand. If you raise your hand, it's worth you following through. Remember, I said I acknowledge, I want to give him my heart and my life. You give him your heart and your life by accepting him as your Lord and Savior. We want to lead you in a prayer. We want to help you change destinies. Get some information into your hands. Listen, let us help you. You said you wanted to do this. Let us help you. So in a moment, what we're going to do is we're going to all stand together. Elijah's going to sing a song. And as we do, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you came with somebody, tell them, will you go with me? If you brought somebody, tell them, I'll go with you. Ushers will help you in the family rooms, wherever you're at. If that's you, as we stand together, come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, come meet me up at the altar, and let's change destinies together today. Jesus, come on, if that's you, you come, come on. guys, you came. Listen, today is a new day. You know, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today's your birthday, your new first day. Listen, here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This right guy right over here waving at you. This is Pastor Joel, all right? Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. He's going to take you right over there and lead you in a prayer. Listen, nothing weird goes on. I promise I am as weird as it gets. Pastor Dan might be just a little bit more weird, but nothing weird goes on over there, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free information, and the last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. You go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. They help you get strong and make sure you're working out the right way. A spiritual personal trainer, a friend, somebody will meet with you for, uh, for a couple minutes before service. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for five weeks. 
They'll teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong so you don't go back to the life that you came from and you stay strong and keep going and persevere in this walk that you're endeavoring in. So if you guys would just go with Pastor jo- Joel to your left. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.